I'm Jason Wright, and this is the Texas Titans Podcast. Just like the name of the podcast suggests, I will be visiting with Texas Titans of business, academia, sports, or whatever their chosen field, looking for the disciplines and habits that have made these Texans so remarkable. Success leaves clues, and I want to crack the code to these Titans' success and share it with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Texas Titans Podcast. Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Texas Titans Podcast. I am so thankful for you being here. Thank you for continuing to listen. Today's show is fantastic. Today I sit down with the founder and president of APEC. APEC, what does that stand for? Athletic Performance Enhancement Center. And Bobby Stroop is the president and founder of this. And it was a really cool episode for me for a couple of reasons. One, I get to sit down with an entrepreneur and discuss the journey of starting his business, going through the struggles, going through some of those dark times that nearly every single entrepreneur is bound to have. You're going to find out about that. You're going to hear that story. And then also getting to talk about fitness and wellness and agility and some of those things that, and and what I'm really interested in is longevity. Now I say fitness, APEC is not the type, it's not a gym. It's not really, and Bobby will tell you, he's not into quote unquote fitness. It's about performance enhancement. It's about if you want to get faster, more agile. If you're wanting to go to the NFL combine, those are the types of clients that APEC sees and works with. So as a matter of fact, they've worked with some of the top names in the NFL, major league baseball, and I'm going to read to you Bobby's uh, uh, professional bio because you'll see just exactly what APEC is all about and what Bobby is about as well. Bobby Stroop is the founder and president of Athletic Performance Enhancement Center, APEC. Coach Stroop has directed human performance systems for nearly 20 years while expanding his influence as an author, consultant, speaker, and educator. His experience includes working with school systems, collegiate teams, professional teams, businesses, corporate fitness, and individuals alike. His coaching ranges from youth athletes to some of the top names in multiple professional sports, including first-round picks, Super Bowl, and World Series champions. APEC has been part of developing over 20 athletes that trained in the APEC system in grade school and continued all the way to the professional ranks. Stroop and team currently support over 100 athletes in the NFL and MLB alone. Among many accomplishments by his athletes, Bobby has been credited with supporting arguably some of the best in the game of baseball and football, including NFL MVP Patrick Mahomes. Coach Stroop has been Uh, featured as a top trainer for multiple sports and athletic performances on ESPN, Sports Illustrated, USA Today, NFL, and MLB Network, Stack, Bleacher Report, and many more. Bobby has presented on various human performance topics at notable coaches' clinics internationally, including the Nike Roundtable and the China City Bowl Tour. Stroop launched the CapEx certification at Nike World Headquarters in addition to doing work with the Nike Training and the and the Nike Young Athlete Division. Bobby serves on the advisory committee for wellness and exercise at Tyler Junior College. Stroop and staff have powered strength and conditioning for TJC baseball during their four time, that's four, four time in a row national championship run. As an entrepreneur, Stroop and team built APEC from a grass field in 2005 to today, a worldwide training leader in human performance. Bobby serves as the president for APEC, making strategic decisions, designing training systems, and guiding an elite team of coaches that power two locations, Tyler and Fort Worth. Coach Stroop belongs to an elite group of physical therapists, athletic trainers, and human performance practitioners as a fellow of Applied Functional Science. Stroop has also been named a RSCCD by the NSCA due to 10-plus years of demonstrating high standards and professional practice. Folks, here's what you're going to get from this interview. You're going to hear about a guy who set out on a path to do exactly what he wanted to do, to do what he loves, and took some turns along the way, although staying in his lane, and by staying in his lane and going through the the bumps and the naturally come, has ended up with one of the most respected businesses in athletic performance enhancement in the country. This was a great interview. It was a great conversation with Bobby. I hope you enjoyed as much as I as much as I did. And again, Thank you so much for listening. I thank you for what you're doing for the Texas Titans podcast. We continue to grow in listenership. We're getting so much good feedback. And 
I could not be more grateful. So please, please, please continue to listen and enjoy this conversation with the president and founder of Athletic Performance Enhancement Center, or APEC, Bobby Stroop. Thanks so much. Hey folks, this episode of the Texas Titans podcast is brought to you by Crown & Caliber. They are the smarter way to buy or sell a watch. They carry more than 40 brands including Rolex, Omega, Cartier, Breitling, and Panerai. Plus, with a full-time staff of watchmakers and refinishers, they make sure every watch that comes through their shop is authentic and working as the manufacturer intended. Every watch comes with a one-year warranty and a hassle-free return policy. So, If it doesn't look or fit quite like you hoped, you can just send it back and our listeners can get $150 off for their first purchase over $2,000 with the code TITAN150. Folks, I have been to their facilities. I have met their watchmakers. They are top notch. This is a great organization from the founder of the company all the way through. It's a great organization. If you are looking for a premium luxury watch to either buy or or sell with a group that you can depend on to treat you right, Crown and Caliber. Crownandcaliber.com. Check them out. Bobby Stroop, how are you, brother? Man, I'm great. It's good to be here. Well, I tell you what. Okay, so like I was talking about before we got on, we got so many things that I want to cover with you because not only do you hit on my passion for small business, entrepreneurship, and a small business that I've watched get bigger and bigger. And I have watched you through the early days of concept for APEC and what you were doing to where you are now, which is training professional athletes. I mean, literally, it's very rare that a pro athlete comes out of East Texas that hasn't spent some time, uh, spent some time with you and your team learning agility, speed training, all that. So we'll get into that. So we got that passion there, which is health and fitness, which this my podcast audience is probably so sick of hearing me talk about <laughs> what you have right here to my right, which is the Peloton bike. Right, right. <laughs> so, so we have that in common. Um, so I think the best thing to do is let's just start out with you, you know, just Bobby Stroop, where you're from, and talk to me about not just how you decided to get into business for yourself and become an entrepreneur, but how you found your way into to fitness and kind of, and then turning that into your life's work. Yeah. So just starting off from the very beginning, um, I was a premature kid. My family calls me a miracle baby. I, there was quite an emergency, some issues. My mom was lucky to make it out as, as was I. Um, when I was young, I was a kid that had you know, I had braces on my legs, like Forrest Gump. Like oh. I was, I was the smallest kid in my grade, boy or girl, till middle school. So, um, not a sob story. A great life, great parents. But you know, from the beginning, you know, the outlook was you you better you better hurry up to keep up type thing. Mm-hmm. And so it was always that state of mind of I wonder if I could find a way to to get better at this, or I want to be as good as them at this. Right. And and you know, just like many people that are great at a lot of things. Um, I think for me, the the aspirations to be great at, at what I'm currently doing were began with just that selfish pursuit of trying to be good enough um, and trying to be you know someone that that wasn't a standout in the wrong way. And I had great support. I you know I, I grew into um, being someone that was supported by my parents to to um, to to be a, an athlete that performed at a high level. I broke some track records. Played college football. But by that time, I knew, you know, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to take that same thing that I selfishly tried to find for for myself, and I wanted to to make that a career. Now, at the time, uh, my dad was like, that's not a job. That's actually, you're just going to be a coach, Um, which was probably sound advice. Um, I'm a little bit of a off the beaten path kind of guy, so I didn't listen to him, shocker. But, um, you know, when I was a senior I had a pretty serious injury. I had a fracture, to, an avulsion fracture, iliac crest. So being a speed athlete, someone that was being looked at by TCU back when a um, uh, friend and uh, what's, the, what's the head coach there now? He was the defensive coordinator then. Oh, yeah. I'm, now you got me yeah, drawing a blank. But you know who I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah. He was the defensive coordinator then, and um, things were going good. I, but when you have an avulsion fracture and your thing is speed, it's not a good situation. Right. So my future was kind of up in the air, and we didn't have a lot of great therapy and options there. So I actually started investigating therapy and 
other things. That's when the transition went from focus internally to externally. So some of my teammates started staying after with me, and then I started training some of them, and that's really when it kind of started. When I got to college, like I said, I knew what I wanted to do, so I was a pretty strange kid. Um, when it was time for spring break or Christmas break or summer, I, all I wanted you know, was an opportunity to go intern here, learn from this doctor or trainer here, work for this person here. So um, when I came out of college, you know, I had a lot of experience working for Hall of Fame coaches and trainers and um, quite a resume built up. And I'd had a job secured from two years in to go to Hawaii and start my career there. So wow. never intended on being an entrepreneur. Um, things kind of went wrong. And that's how I kind of ended up in entrepreneurship. Really? All right. Well, well let's talk about that. I mean, that, that, that's we, I, it's Gary Patterson, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, Gary yeah, Patterson. Gary. So course. this shows you. Sorry, Gary. OK. Yeah, exactly. So um, and, you know, we have that in common. So this shows my age, man. I did a recruiting visit to TCU whenever I was coming out of Sulphur Springs, and that's back when Pat Sullivan was the head coach. Before friend. Yeah. So yeah. that was – I was almost all the way back to the Wacker days, man, so I'm old. No, dude. <laughs> it I, me feel I, old. Yeah, we're all moving along. All right. all right, so something bad happens. You become an entrepreneur. Talk to me. I say bad. Um, so I had an incredible mentor in Tim Powers that actually spent time here. Right. Um, a lot of people don't know my connection to East Texas is that – my grandparents had a ranch in Gladewater. Water, yeah. the now, where did you grow up? Yeah, so my dad was in the oil field, so I lived like seven places in 12 years. Gotcha. We moved around a lot, but home base was always East Texas because of my grand, grandmother's ranch. Yep. Okay. So that was always my connection. Okay. Well, my uncle was the ER doctor here. Mother Francis has been for 30 years. Yeah. And um, there was a guy named Tim Powers at the hospital hired to do sports medicine. He like, come come stay with me in the summer. You know, it was mm-hmm. my freshman year of college, and I was playing ball and running track. And came and uh, developed a real um, influential relationship with Tim. He really took me under his wing and taught me what it meant to be an actual coach, like how to impact people's lives. And mm-hmm. it, it meant the world to me, so I would have gone anywhere. I basically committed to him to, to go wherever. And he moved to Hawaii and had an academy there, a sports medicine or sports training academy. And I didn't interview for any jobs. I had Hall of Fame football coaches I, I turned down opportunities for. Um, so as soon as I finished – playing ball i actually ended up playing arena football that was kind of a surprise so it delayed my time when i got done with that went to hawaii i'm there place goes out of business oh wow, <laughs> I mean, wow. so i not only it's did a I long not, way from east texas too. right and being a young arrogant human being I, I just i did not understand the importance of creating good relationships when people were extending opportunities to me so i, I did not even think for a second i'm going to need to come back to this person asking for yeah. a job yeah. And so I was, it, this is the wrong time of year. I mean, in October, you don't want to be looking for a coaching job. Right. So coming back, um, humble, being humbled, <laughs> coming back to, to, my parents were living in Denton at the time. I just drove around and I walked up to a, a Lifetime Fitness. Uh, it was actually a, con, a construction trailer and they were, it was a huge building, never seen it before in Flower Mound, Texas. Uh-huh. Went in, um, was super arrogant, which is a theme you're going to, probably catch on to just told them, you know, I'm overqualified. I've got all these certifications and I'm, I trained, you know, I've trained some professional athletes. And at the time I had, and I wasn't leading on those initiatives, but mm-hmm. I had through my training and I'm like, I can definitely manage this. And they're like, you're hired. Right. So that was, a, <laughs> that was terrible. So I'm, you know, I'm 25. I am, um, managing a $70 million facility. I'm the head of fitness and my management shift is one to 9 PM, which I got, 1.5% override on the training okay. for for personal training. But in order to make money, I had to do personal training outside of my 1 to 9 shift. Wow. So, so you're, you're talking all the time. 5 a.m., 6 a.m., yeah. 7 a.m., 8 a.m., yeah. 9 a.m., 10 a.m., take a nap in my truck, manage. Wow. And what it ended up being was every day I was meeting with a spouse that was mad that their spouse was sleeping with one of my trainers. Mm-hmm. I was cooperating with police on a drug investigation with one of my trainers. I was um, doing refunds, having meetings about upselling nutrition, all the things that I never wanted to do. And, you know, just to be transparent, I had a six figure income at 25 years old, all commission, 100% commission. Mm-hmm. And I was miserable with a three bedroom apartment in Dallas, Texas. And for no reason mm-hmm. lost my lost my path with with my faith lost uh my direction uh, it was just a it was a dark time and mm-hmm. what most people thought 
was a time that needed to be celebrated. Yep. And there was a real defining moment. Um, you know, every day is part of my job. Right when I get on shift as a manager, you walk the floor, you t- find 10 people that you need to talk to, and then you try to sell them something. Right. Well, what I did instead is I would go out there, because you have to write your names down. Mm-hmm. I'd go out there and talk to 10 people and just try to help and say, what is it something that you don't know how to use in this place that I can help you with? And so there was a young lady um, that, I, that I spoke with and took some time to try to help her figure out mm-hmm. some things. And she said, you need to meet my husband. And I thought, oh, well, here we go. Um, <laughs> hope I wasn't. I, I don't feel like I was inappropriate. But right. um, she's like, yeah, I'm going to send him up here tomorrow. I was like, okay. Yeah. Um, she's like, can I have your car? Sure. Next day, guy comes up there. I mean, explicative of this, that. I need to talk to Bobby Stroop. And um, <laughs> they're like, he's in his office. So <laughs> they send him in there. And this guy's like, hey, um, I, mean, I, mean, I don't want to say this person's name because they're high profile but basically gotcha. you know, like my name is x i'm a therapist and strength coach for the dallas cowboys and wow. and i'm here to tell you to get the out of here really and i said well um where would you like for me to go are you <laughs> offering me a job he's like no here, here's what i know i know that you talked to my wife and that she said that you don't belong in this place and that that you have a passion to do what i do and you need to leave and i'm telling you right now you need to quit and you need to leave this place and go do what you're supposed to be doing. Wow. And so <laughs> I didn't know this guy from Adam. We've, wow. We now have a, a professional relationship. Uh-huh. Um, he is the director and co-owner of a, you know, a top three human performance company in the world. Okay. And, um, and since then, he's tried to get me to come work with him several times. But now we've got, I've got my own thing. So with, with that, wasn't six months. I got a call from some physical therapists here that say, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. Matt Flynn and... Some guys gave us uh, your name and said, and Tim Powers, and uh-huh. said that uh, you might be a good guy to maybe run some camps um, as a part of our physical therapy clinic. And it was poor negotiation skills. I was like, yes, I'll do it. I'm leaving. I'll do it. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Yep. So that is the genesis of my entrepreneur journey. Wow. Now, at this time, so, okay, so APEC, yeah. the old facility, it wasn't open yet? Or it was? And, no, it okay, was yeah, nothing. It, yeah. was, it wasn't even a brainchild. This, is, this was in 2000. Fall of 2005, when I got wow. this call, um, and so we didn't have a name. We didn't, it was like we literally met at we met at that place by Hot Tots. Um, oh, well, that used to be Cafe Taza, the, the coffee shop. Or wait, no, it was before that time. It was before the time yeah, of that. Way, back. way before the time of that. Um, yeah, that was a different meeting. <laughs> we, we, anyway, we met somewhere and we basically discussed like, okay, I'm going to do performance training and, and, and then we're going to eventually raise money for a facility, which ended up being the old APEC. Okay. So at the time, I literally worked out of uh, PTS, which was in the Green Acre Shopping Center by yeah. Audacious. Yeah, yeah. I got the opportunity to train there from 5 to 7 in the morning and then from 5 p.m. to close. Okay. And, uh, and so when I came, we didn't even have a name. Really? It wasn't APEC. Okay. It was just... And how does APEC come about? How did, what, how did that happen? <laughs> I mean, the three of us had a meeting, and it's like, well, what do you what do you do well? And I said, speed. You know, that's my thing, speed. Yeah. And it's like, okay. So we were Accelerate. Well, then we were getting calls from uh, car people. Fast and Furious was a big deal, so a lot, <laughs> yeah. a lot of calls on that. <laughs> right. That was not what I wanted. <laughs> right. So then we added Performance Enhancement Camp because we only had camps at the time. I went door-to-door trying to sell camps the whole year. And only got 13 people. It was humiliating from coming from working with, you know, I'd have two or 300 working for GA Moore yeah. and Salina and those guys. And you know, anyway. But wait, um, but wait, right there. That's yeah. a perfect place to, because that it, to me is something, any entrepreneur, anybody, I don't care if you're in sales, I don't care what, if you're, what you're doing, those times whenever you hit what Seth Godin calls the dip, where you start yeah. to question, I, I literally, I just blogged about this, about the don't, I, it's titled Don't Stop. And it has to do with those times where you feel like you're trudging through wet cement. Take me through those times, your mental capacity, your, I want to know about the self-doubts and how you fought through that to stay on course and stay in your lane and keep pursuing what you're doing. I mean, just talk about some of those days of, and, and, and not to, I mean, this just I get excited about this because literally the thing that inspired my last blog was John Acuff, who is now a New York Times bestseller. Yeah. He plays huge venues now as far I mean, he's doing even stand up comedy. But I mean, whenever he does his public speaking, 
It's a packed audience. He's, he's just crushing it now. But he posted a picture of his very first meetup for people from his blog. And literally, it's just him. And two people showed up. And the whole thing is talking about where you were at that point. Yeah. Trying to, you know, you think you've got an idea. You know your talents. You know your abilities. But nobody else does. And then you yeah. get out there. You, you put it on the line. And people don't show up. So talk a little bit about those times. I mean, it was it was, it was, was hard. I I came down here ready to light the world on fire. I had great coaches and mentors and people in my corner. and. Mm-hmm. You just don't know what's being provided for you until it's not, mm-hmm. and you just don't. And and anybody out there that thinks that they know, you don't. Mm-hmm. You you can make an assumption, you can try to draw the lines and connect the dots, but you don't. And that first camp, having thirteen people, having gone door to door, and all these, I didn't. I'm not from here, so I, I was told like, go to the Holly Tree, go to this, go to that, and I was just knocking, and people were like praying for it with me. Right. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this poor kid. But, um, you know, I had my mom out there helping me from signups and my neighbor and it was, it was humbling. It was necessary, but it was dark. And I remember thinking this was, this was a huge mistake, you know, yep. and, and it grew slowly. And then there were just always, anytime I'd make any progress, these just, Oh, I mean, these, these things that seem immovable, you know, these problems that seem like unsolvable Mm -hmm. and you know, it was, it was hard. I mean, there were, look, I would love to sit here and tell you that I just put my head down and pushed through it, but I looked for ways out at at times. Yeah. You know, I almost took a job at Kansas state in 2007. Uh, no, it was 2008. I almost took a job at Kansas state in 2007 In 2009, I almost went to start a top, what is now a top three human performance training facility in the world with that person really? that I mentioned earlier. Um, there's been times along the way that there's been opportunities and things that I thought, should I go? Should I stay? Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, but for one reason or another, whether it be a boundary or a conscious decision, God's, God's kept me here. And I, at this point, I'm, I'm so glad. You know, and there's, you know, with partners, there's, that's a whole nother bag. Um, but I've learned a tremendous amount from the three partners that I've had. Right. Um, I'm very happy that I am the sole owner now. Mm-hmm. Um, I've learned a lot. All of them brought, all of them brought value to my decision making yeah. currently. But there were some very difficult situations there. You know, I, I don't have a passion for business. I didn't go to school for business. Right. I'm overly trusting. I'm. Um, I just want to work on my craft. I'm a, what they would call a technician. Right. That's what I want to do. I'm a creator. I'm a creative thinker. I'm not logistics and business and communication cycles and chain mm-hmm. of command is not a passion that I've ever had nor wanted. I never wanted to be a business owner. Right. So I've been, you know, I've put myself in some situations that were not advantageous. And there were two times where I thought we were getting a new facility. Mm-hmm. And it fell through. Yep. And we had to start over. There yep. was one time I thought we had funding, and then it turns out we didn't. Right. Um, and so I've had some good people step up to the plate and bet on us a few times as well. And it's just, man, it's been an incredibly emotional journey. Oh, I can imagine. And that's the thing, you know, that kind of like we talked about offline is that a lot of people, and, you know, for those who haven't listened to the Phil Burks episode, I mentioned it to Bobby before we got on. If it, go back and listen to the podcast with Phil Burks. Uh, one of the most successful entrepreneurs in this area, I mean, in, in this country. I mean, a very, yeah. very, it just happens to be in Tyler, Texas. And he's very transparent with some of the struggles and those dark days that he went through of just plowing ahead. And he talks about getting, you know, in trouble with the IRS to the point that literally they seized his wife's paycheck. And wow. she had no idea what was going on. And it's a very emotional thing for him to talk about, but he's willing to tell the story about this is what you have to be willing. I mean, when they, when you, the proverbial burn your ships, you know, guys yep. like you, him, and so many other entrepreneurs, they've done it. And so a lot of people, they think they want this, what they see is this glamorous lifestyle of entrepreneurship, owning your own business, being the boss. And But there are inevitably, there are those dark days of, you know, uh, Thomas Wheat, who's going to be coming on the show uh, here pretty soon. We've already recorded his podcast. Same thing. He's like, man, I had to cash in retirement. I had to do things yep. to pay, make payroll that just don't make sense from a long-term financial perspective. 
But you, if you believe in what you're doing, you have to do that. So I think what you're talking about is so good for anybody out there who is two things. If you're wanting to be an entrepreneur, listen up. This is the the, the, the stuff you got to go through. But also, if you are that entrepreneur and you're in that position, you know, I know how this story ends because I drive by, you know, East Grande all the time and I see this amazing facility and I know about Patrick Mahomes and, and all these other incredible athletes that have come through APEC. So this story ends well, but understand you got to go through it, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, I've, I've had to take out a line of credit loans. I've, I've half a dozen times depleted lifetime savings. I mean – there's been a lot and, yeah. and right when you think it's over it's you know it's not right and so you just you learn and man we could things could happen tomorrow but I, i'm a lot more confident in our problem solving ability and our ability right. to to bet on ourselves at this point but it is a journey it is a journey all right so when does apec as the the first one and, and i know the people listening around the state have no idea where new copeland road is but yep. new copeland road <laughs> it opens up and so that's where it starts and and bobby talk about the fact that it's a different it's not a gym for for, for those of you who have like um like bobby was talking about these lifetime fitness yeah lifetime fitness uh planet fitness uh, whatever where there's just a you know there's a uh cardio deck and weights you know where you walk in you kind of you're, that's not what apec is right so kind of talk to us about the genesis of that it gets you open your facility yep. and what the strategy is to go beyond 12 people showing up for the camp right to you know kind of getting some traction yeah so uh, about a year and a half in we opened a training facility and the, the difference between a, a gym and a training facility is there's no memberships typically at a training facility there's training programs you sign up Mm -hmm. for um and so we built it with human performance in mind not fitness we actually didn't take on adult clients until 2012 so it was all a focus and this is 2006 or 2000 early 2007 mind you so and real quick bobby i want to just just so that the audience understands human performance versus fitness they may go well i thought they were the same thing but what you're saying is you have an athlete that wants to be faster. Right. You want them to perform faster than they currently are, as opposed to just being in good cardiovascular shape. Right. right? Like, we're not doing workouts. We're doing progressive plans of action for yep. periodization for ligament tendon adaptations, biomechanics, changing yep. in, changing acceleration angles, you know, jump higher, run faster, get stronger. Got it. And things that are things that can be not just seen but felt from a yep. performance standpoint. Right. So I'm a, I'm a geek. I'll go I'll – go deep in that if you love me but <laughs> but yeah that's the, that's the main difference and so when we opened up it was kind of a thing where we really just wanted to do the camps i just wanted to do the speed camps and then the facility was just a shell that was just turf basically and it kind of morphed so between 2007 we'll fast track this till 2012 i went from a one person operation to a person and a rotating cast of about 12 part-time employees year round. Okay. And it would be heavy in the summer. And what we eventually did is we built it out to where we could work with 48 people at a time. And I could train people in areas that I felt were safe. For instance, I can teach a coach how to do strength lifts. Mm -hmm. It's hard to teach a coach how to have an eye for improving speed development and movement Mm -hmm. and coaching athletes on movement. So Mm -hmm. I would always put myself on speed, put the other coaches in areas that the fail safe is there and you can constantly continue to grow them. So that's how we did it is we, we, we built it that way, almost like a factory type setting. We started expanding into different programs where there was needs like for young kids that were doing too much of this or that. If I was going to complain about it, I had a rule. If you're going to complain about it as not being good for them, you need to provide something. Mm. So then I would expand into this market, expand into that market, mm-hmm. and just kind of got outside of, okay, what is it that I was actually good at as an athlete? And what is it from a scientific standpoint you know you need to help and affect? And then in 2012, we got our first full-time employee, um, and then we expanded to three by 2013. And you know now we've got we're, – we're around 20 – I think 26 over – two facilities and we do worldwide uh consulting and initiatives in china and wow so that's that's the thirty thousand foot view wow all right so then when as was matt the first professional athlete or first is that when your first who was the first pro athlete that comes through because again yeah. and i say this because literally again folks if there's an east texas athlete 
I mean, anywhere around this area, they probably are going to darken the doorways of Apex Fitness. That's just, I mean, that's just a fact, you know? So. Ch- chances are, but at this point, but that was definitely not the case. Um, you know, Matt Flynn, I actually worked with him under Tim Powers. So that was with Texas SAC. And okay. We did some things together. Um, so I would say the first professional athlete that I worked with as a part of Apex, probably before then there was a dozen guys that I'd worked with as a young coach that was an assistant. Right. Uh, Donovan McNabb and some other guys that were stellar. It was an incredible honor. But coming here, the first athlete that I ever worked with this was, that was a professional under the APEC watch was someone that was doing physical therapy at Physical Therapy Systems okay. under Gordon Island. And his name was Philip Humber. And he was, a, yep. he was a top pick that had just gone through Tommy John surgery. Yep. And there was some difficulty in his road back. And they thought it might be good to supplement his therapy with some training. Mm-hmm. So we started working together, and then very soon after that, um, Travis Chick and Josh Tomlin um, started up. And then, actually, I was volunteering at a football camp for Matt Flynn, and they put me in a group to coach quarterbacks, and my assistant was Graham Harrell, and then we started talking. Wow. And then Graham was like, hey, you know, things didn't work out for me in the NFL. I've been in Canada. Like, what do you think about me coming down here for a month in training? I'm like, let's do it. He came down for a month, or actually ended up staying for four months, put on a ton of weight, uh, met his wife. He didn't know at the time, but he met his wife. <laughs> then he then he went, you know, got into a training camp, made a team, and then we started getting NFL clients. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of funny how those things go, and um, I'm just grateful for those initial opportunities. And Well, and I would I would venture a guess, which, by the way, Graham's at USC now, right? Did yeah, I just hear that? Yeah, he's the OC. Yeah. yeah. How about that? That's big time, man. See? Look it's at that. It's pretty Look fun. At- when he comes through now, he's always giving us giving us gear and... You know, he's like, when are y'all coming to L.A.? I'm like, never. Like, <laughs> why, we're going to cheer you on. Yeah. That's right. Why leave our beloved East Texas? But it sounds to me like because you've seen the fruit of that, that you know, those early days where you, and it's another thing I preach all the time, never take relationships for granted. No. You never, I mean, and it's not about being in seer, networking for that, hey, what can this mean to me one day? It's just, you just never know when you're going to find yourself in a position that those connections and the friendships and the relationships that you make will surface when you least expect it. And so now I guess that's paying off a a wiser, older Bobby Stroop realizes the value of those relationships. And as a result, it sounds like you're seeing the fruit from that, right? Yeah. I mean, I think now we've worked with over 200 athletes, over seven professional sports and 25 of them started with us in elementary school. And I don't know. I don't. I, you know, it's hard to know what to point to for that. But definitely, without those first few opportunities, uh, nothing went perfect there. Yeah. But without those first few opportunities, I don't think I don't think we get that. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. So now let's get into a little bit of the philosophical aspect of this whole thing because yeah. I think that's really important, especially someone like you who. Uh, you yourself are a peak performer in business, and and you have been in athletics, but you also get to see a lot of. I'm sure there's talent that you see that should be playing in the major leagues yeah. as far as the baseball players in the NFL, but they don't have that uh, Patrick Mahomes discipline, that uh, Josh Tomlin, who, by the way, just what an amazing man. What, yeah. Just a, what a great guy. I mean, that guy could have mediocre talent, but his attitude and discipline will make him rise above, you know, so many other athletes. Uh, Travis Chig, you know, Philip, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, uh, my real estate company that I owned here in Tyler, which was what brought me to Tyler when I bought my first real estate company, we sold Philip his first house after he signed his contract. Yep. And so it's, it's, really, it's funny how all this comes full circle. But tell me a little bit about what you see, the common thread. Yeah. And I know some of them are going to be obvious, hard work ethic, whatever, but from you uh, because you're the one making them take that one extra rep. You're the one making them, you know, seeing whether or not they will put in the, that final touch to get to the next level. What do you see in those athletes that end up, end up playing on Sunday versus the ones that don't, what's the common thread between all those? Well, uh, I'd like to start with what's not and what's not is they're not, it's not, a common characteristic that they're overbearing physically. Mm -hmm. They're not always the most dominant athlete Mm -hmm. and through their developmental stages, they're not always the fastest, strongest. They don't always jump the highest. They're not even a standout all the time. 
what is consistent is none of the people that we've had from the elementary level all the way up were ever overly concerned with other people. Mm. Um, they improve skills at a rate that other athletes don't. Mm-hmm. They listen and don't need us to repeat instruction. They ask questions mm-hmm. and they coach their peers and it's natural. Wow. Those are really the only things that we found that have been consistent. Wow. And I think that the, that speaks to the nature of those habits and what they can do for someone professionally. And if, cause I mean, you could talk about a dozen kids. Yeah. Patrick's the one that's got a lot of attention right now and rightfully so, but there's a lot of kids, you know, your Nick Rumbelows and your, mm-hmm. uh, AJ mentors that they weren't that no disrespect for those two, but they weren't world beaters in anything. Mm-hmm. And you don't get to the major league baseball without being elite. Yeah. And so there's a lot of kids we're proud of that are doctors, lawyers, or just good husbands and wives and teachers and everything else. And I just think a lot of those skills is what rubs off to people that are high achievers in anything. Yeah. I don't think it's, I don't think it's just pro, right. but if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's interesting too, you know, like talking about Josh earlier, that's exactly what I took from him. You're talking about a guy that you can just get the sense he's coachable, but not only that, he was willing to teach others to share. And that's why, I mean, the guy's been in the league as long as he has, you know, he, he, he is, he has reached that point where he's a seasoned leader in the Braves organization, not because he's won the Cy Young three times, but the fact that one, he's played on a world series team. He knows what it means to build a team. And he just, you know, his deal is, you know, he says, you know, the thing that he wants to be remembered by from his family, from his teammates, everybody is that he showed up. So it's kind of that whole character thing that, overcomes everything else right i think it is and i think it's just a commitment to what are your what are your core principles yeah you know, what's your foundation because you can't say your foundation is some type of methodology or anything like that right it's got to be deeper than that it's got to be right. broader than that yeah and i think that showing up is a great one because for for him especially because it's simple and if you don't have something simple that you can point to that's consistent i think it's very hard to lose your way because for us i mean the methodology in which we produce adaptations for ligaments and tendons to handle elastic load. Okay. That has changed from high amplitude plyometrics to velocity based training that are slow impact. Like there's that stuff can change. Yeah. What can't change is what's your value for improving the density and elasticity of a tendon or ligament. Right. If you have a high value on that, you have to train that. Yeah. You can't just get that from doing other things from a principal standpoint. Right. And I think that's the same thing with, anyone you've got to have your core tenets your principles you've got to have your you know your beliefs and if you don't have a simple mission statement you probably don't know what you're doing yeah 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 all right so now let's get into your wheelhouse let's geek out because uh, because i mean and i'm kind of geeky here because i'm the same way i'm constantly researching figuring out because you know at 44 years old man yeah. I mean, I'm at that pivotal age, and I'm at that crazy like age. You're in your prime. Well, see, that's the, but that's the, that's, a, that's problematic. It's good and it's problematic. And okay, I can still leapfrog over Jim Lynn's head, sure. and that's cool. It makes for great Instagram posts. But yeah. I know one of these days, Bobby, the landing is going to be really ugly. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's so it's like scary. It's like I've I've still physically now I haven't timed in the forty or the two hundred or the hundred in a long time, but. Right. Uh, but I still physically feel exactly the same as yeah. when I was 25. And I've, that's, I've worked to do that, but I know the time is coming that the recovery will be a lot slower. And I right. guess sometimes it, it is slower if I go out and really push it hard. So let's talk about, let's just cover one, whatever you think is most important. But for me, selfishly, I want to know about longevity. Yeah. And again, I'm not a professional athlete. That's one of the things I talked to Josh about. I was like, man, you know, you've got so many guys now like me who were working out as though we're going to be pitching on Saturday when in reality we're not, we might be running to the grocery store, you know, and when I say, and by running, I mean getting in our Tahoe and right, driving, right. but we still with CrossFit and all this stuff. So kind of, first of all, talk to me about what do I need to be doing yeah. to make sure that I sustain longevity to be able to do the things I want to do and have the quality of life. My back is protected because that's one of the things I'm real scared of is messing up my back. Oh, yeah. And then talk about some of just the stupid things that people are doing. And, and I'll say this because you may not want to because I know you've got competitors in this space, but 
for me at 44, I just think CrossFit is stupid. I think that the guys are, are awesome that do it. They look amazing. Yeah. I mean, you know, the the world's fittest guy, I'm drawing a blank on his, his name. Franny. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, he's a CrossFit guy. Interesting guy. They're amazing. I yeah. get it. But at, I don't think I need to be doing hang snatches and, <laughs> and deadlifting 400 pounds at 44 years old. So I just think some of that stuff's silly. But tell me what you would – First of all, what you would do to tell the, the listener out there, here's what you do if you want to maintain yeah. quality of life and longevity. Let's start there. And then I want to talk about um, how you make somebody faster, how that happens. So let's, let's start with the longevity. Awesome, man. Well, let, let's do this. Let's start with the physiology um, components of a 44-year-old man. Okay. So someone like you is in optimal shape for 44. I mean, you're definitely top three percentile what you would want a 44-year-old man's body composition to be, uh, approach to fitness, priorities, everything. That's okay. straight away. That's easy to see. Awesome. However, here, here's the issue. When, when you're you know, somewhere between that 36 and 46 range, the physiology of your soft tissue changes quite a bit. So what can happen is – in those areas where your tendon and your ligament structures, I'll, I'll just say for an understandable term, bleed into the muscle structures, mm -hmm. there can be some rigidity. Okay. And what happens is, is that rigidity is formed because your collagen matrix has matured. Okay. And because you're not an at, well, because your body's changing from a someone that produces power at a high level to mm -hmm. someone that is going to be f really more of a, mechanism of strength and stability yep. those things become r rigid so it's a dangerous time because men can still produce power to how rate because they have just enough hormonal levels to exactly. do that however their tendon and ligament structures have lost a lot of those elastic fibers mm -hmm. so the way i could explain this is if you had a mop and it was wet and it was constantly wet it's easy to swing around and maneuver on the ground uh -huh. if if when you're a 44 year old man Imagine you don't get any water anymore, but you still have the mops. When you do things, you move it around. So what is the danger? If you make a movement, yeah. now everything in that mop is very brittle, right. and it's very dangerous, and it's very hard to keep it in that state where it's lubricated or, or uh -huh. able to move. And So that's what you have to consider is that the risk factors for explosive movements are amplified, right. but you still have the testosterone levels to actually do those. So it's very right. dangerous time for you. <laughs> exactly. So what, like what you said, you can jump over Jim Lynn's head, but should you, because <laughs> right, right. <laughs> even if you're biomechanically perfect in the way you move or land, the risk factors are higher. So that being said, what should someone your age target? Well, you still want to produce power, because and by the way definition of power is not endurance despite what some people have decided to say that it is um, power is is a definition of it's 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 a rate okay. it's a it's a rate of force it's how fast you can move an amount of weight and, and in what period of time you can move that in and how explosive it is so <clears throat> with that being said the byproduct of power is neurotrophic growth hormone testosterone levels mm -hmm. basically it's a youth serum yeah well you want that but you don't want to do plyometrics to get it because it's dangerous so how can you get it rapid fire movements uh, with bands um chops mm -hmm. things that are high amplitude low weight M moving weight at zero to 40 percent of your maximum yeah you know as many reps as you can in eight seconds okay but the problem is, is doing those things safely can be difficult. And that's mm -hmm. why we've invested some equipment to do that. But you could definitely do body weight squats as fast as you can. Things right. like this. Now, the problem is, is that people, it's counterintuitive because they're like, well, this isn't hard enough in this way. Or this doesn't feel right in right. this way. But if you understand the, the neurotrophic growth hormone and elevated testosterone levels, and those types of things bring density back to mm -hmm. the, those soft tissues, then that is of value and it is okay. worth your time. Okay. So those are things you do need to do. Now... I would never I'm not I'm not an advocator of doing plyometrics for endurance because physiologically it doesn't make sense and for those of us that went to college probably learned that mm -hmm. but the creators of CrossFit did not go to college right. and so I don't know if they know that or not. Right. Um, but if you if you pick the highest amplitude exercises that burn the most calories per rep and you put all those together in a workout you need to understood understand that those were designed to be 0 to 3 reps for as maximum power, mm -hmm. maximum rate of force. Okay. So they were actually built to to help build power metrics like what we talked about, right. but they're doing them for endurance. 
So you're absolutely targeting tissues in the exact wrong way. Yeah. Now, could you get ripped? Yes. Um, but look, you know, I'm of the mind that God didn't make a mistake with grains either. So you can literally be dumber for, for restricting yourself from carbs. Mm -hmm. Literally mm -hmm. it can affect the way you do math, yeah. anything else. Yeah. And you can literally be destroying your body from the inside out and look really good by doing plyometrics for endurance. Mm. So I guess I went on a long rant to tell you, I would continue with your cardio. You have to mix in, you need to mix in strength training. Mm -hmm. and, and when I say mix in strength training, um, push to pull yep. ratios, yep. Uh, vertical, horizontal, yep. unilateral, bilateral. You need to make sure you move in five to six times of co core conditioning exposure. Okay. And then you need, you need exposure to power development to keep your hormone levels up okay. naturally. Okay. Cause, cause we got it. We're in an, we're in an age where men want to be medicated to, to have what they could get that is primal. Mm -hmm. If you just train the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a primal thing. Like, look, if you got to throw a spear to get dinner, yeah. then you're going to have testosterone and growth hormone, right. no trophic growth yeah. factor. Right. Okay. But if you're not the guy that throws a spear anymore for 20 years, then your body's saying, I want to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. I don't need it. Yeah. So that, and that's now I'm ranting, but no, that's good though. But that's this is the kind of stuff that I'm passionate about is that, you know, you, these fads and these things, that's usually from an incomplete piece of information or something that's misunderstood mm -hmm. because I don't believe that the adaptations that are in place that God put in place and the food that's available to us is here for an accident. Right. Right. And I always look to that first, you know, people ask me how much you should rest. And I say, well, Jesus says one day, so let's start there mm -hmm. and then let's go look at the science that backs some of these things up. So, um, I don't know if that even answers your question at all. No, that's that's, that's awesome. That's perfect, and and I, I love your rants because that's what I want. I mean, that's what the the listeners will benefit from it uh, to understand better what you have to do. And uh, now you mentioned it about carbs, and you know, talk to me about nutrition. You yeah. know, kind of what what's the right balance? What's the right mix? And is it the same for everybody based on age, body type, or goals? Kind of tell me what your thoughts are on that. So I think nutrition is very goal specific and I think that there's no one way to do it. Like saying paleo is good or bad is crazy. Paleo could be really good for people in certain situations. Paleo could be really bad for other. And one of my good friends is the, the paleo chef on Instagram. She's fantastic, but I always tell her like, I'm not doing paleo cause then I won't be able to focus. Like I, but it just depends on, mm -hmm. it depends on blood type. It depends on genetics. It depends on your goals. Like for me, I'm truly not a fitness professional. I hired one of those. Mm -hmm. I really don't like working with adults because they don't do what I tell them to do most of the time. <laughs> but, well, I, and, and quite honestly, for me, my goals aren't to have a six pack. I'm married. I love my family. I just want to be able to give good examples. If I have too low body fat, I get hurt more. Mm -hmm. um, I like to eat. I enjoy food. It's a passion of mine. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep a balance that's, mm -hmm that's that fits my lifestyle and and since i'm not a health a fitness professional i'm a human performance professional i'm not measured as often on how i look for people to listen to me and now right. that i have a resume i really don't care yeah <laughs> i'm right. just being honest with, <laughs> yeah. with you but um i think that i think that nutrition is something that should be looked at as a fueling system mm -hmm. and it should be looked at as what are the goals for me? What do I need to accomplish? You know, some people are like, well, what about intermittent fasting? And my response to them is if you sit at a desk all day and you're in a low stress, uh, job, I think it's a fantastic option for mm -hmm. you. Or if there's a period of the time every day that you have to sit, I think it's a great situation for you. Yeah. Um, if you work all day long and you're up and down all day long and you have to you know, if you're a sniper, it's probably not a good idea. Right. If you're if you're someone like me that has to jump in and give an example about how to do a three point takeoff or do a box jump without warming up, and you're too old to be doing that, mm -hmm. like you ought not be carb depleted. Right. Um, you ought not to have not had your the fats and the macros that you should have had to 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 be able to support those things. Right. So I guess what I would say is my philosophy on nutrition is open minded. Yeah. And um, while we do have generalized, I would not call them plans, when we do have generalized bandwidth of decision-making mm -hmm. that we want our people to go through, mm -hmm. um, things get specific the more you get to know them and the more you f you troubleshoot, okay, this didn't work for you, this did work for you. Right. You know, I have people that will straight up tell me, I'm never going to not drink wine every night, mm -hmm. and I'm never going to not eat Mexican food, so what are you going to do now? Yeah. And I'll say, okay, now I can work on that later. Mm -hmm. But... 
what I need to focus on right now is how can I accommodate the values that they have on their life mm-hmm. and help them be the best version of themselves. That's our mantra, be the best you, and help them live. Because my, my goal isn't to get everybody in East Texas and Fort Worth and everywhere else we consult and work to get divorced because they look better and, you know, right. and not that that's the goal. It's not all, it's not right. hardly never the goal. Right. And, but what I'm saying is, is some people, they just value being able to go hike Banff yeah. or yeah. man, I'm tired of not being able to stay out there when my kids are playing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and that's really what the genesis of our adult program was is to who's offering someone something for that person. Right. Because if we're going to say that when you come in here, you, you know, we don't need to be telling people like you need this body fat percentage. We need to listen. Yeah. yeah. We need to listen and say, well, you, sh- you don't want your back to hurt anymore. Okay. Right. Let's start there. Yeah. And, uh, I got, I got way too philosophical for you on there and don't get me wrong. We've taken all kinds of precision nutrition courses, sports nutrition in it, but we always arrive at, there's not a way there's, there's more of a philosophy and decision-making process. Well, but no, and you didn't get too philosophical. And as a matter of fact, you hit on something I think, especially for guys like me that to hear, like I'm a, I don't color outside the lines and I am a, I'm the most coachable guy ever. Like, and I get almost, I get very rigid. You know, if you tell me no carbs, I won't touch a carb. You know, yep. It drives Jemlin crazy. Cause I get so, if I'm intermittent fasting, then we are not eating you know, before it's probably 16 hours plus a little bit, you know, because yeah. just a 16 hour, man, that's what everybody's doing. What everybody you know, I got to have a little, little more time yeah, on there. Yeah, really? Yeah. And, you know, Peter Atia, Dr. Peter Atia, who that's his thing is, is fasting and that's, he's made it, he's one of the guys that's made it so famous, yeah. but he had a great, uh, there you go. Uh, he, he had a great post on Instagram the other day or yesterday where he was um, speaking to a group at some university or something that had a Panera Bread. And he, and he, and I, I thought it was really cool because he filmed us. He said, look, guess what? I'm going to eat at Panera Bread. I haven't been to one in a long time. He's like, and he's, he's saying, he goes, of all things to cause me to break my fast, a Panera Bread, he said, but I'm going to do it. And he said, I might even eat that piece of bread right there. And he said, because I'm human and I'm going to allow myself to do that. And so what you're saying is that, and it was what I'm trying to accept. And same thing, Tim Ferriss, who I read a lot yeah. of his stuff, you know, and the four hour body. And he's kind of, the, you know, that's his deal. He's the human guinea pig. He's done yep. every diet just so he could report back. And he says, look, if you're doing intermittent fasting and you're snapping everybody's head off, you're falling asleep at your desk, eat a bag of freaking almonds or something. Yeah. You know, it's just not worth it. It's and not. So it's good to hear you say that because that sounds like the approach. It's like, yeah, do what works for you, but also live your life and that's what i i have a hard time with at times like when i when jim lynn bought me my peloton for christmas i mean it drives her crazy that literally i think i have from the time i had my first ride till now i've missed maybe 10 days of not having a ride and that's probably because i was out of town or something like that you know i'm kind of obsessive about it so all right now let's talk about just a little bit of your science to let's say that i am an athlete yep I'm going to the combine, you know, I, 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 my, I aspire to be an NFL football player, but I've got to shave, you know, I mean, that's kind of the deal, right? I've got to shave at least a little bit off my 40 time right. strengths. I would think, and I, and I may be wrong. I would think strength is more, that seems to me, the lay person, yep. a little less technical than make me faster. That seems like, wow, because there are a lot of people listen to this and, you know, around the world, they think, well, either you're fast or you're not. Either you're smart or you're dumb. That's kind of one of those yeah. born with it things. Yeah. What do you, how do you take that athlete in and start processing them? And what does that process look like? Yeah. So, just a point of reference, we've had about 60 uh, NFL Pro Day Combine athletes in the last three years. So, we've had, we've had our fill and opportunity in that, um, and probably 100 over the last 10 years. And what I would say is that you can't make a, che- a rhino into a cheetah, but you can you can make someone faster. And I would say that the the range as far as how much faster I've seen as much as twenty five percent faster. Wow. Um, and 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 that's insane. But it's easier the younger they are. Now, when you get to the combine level, the most extreme that I've ever seen is about six tenths of a second and that's usually with linemen when you get down to skill players if you have someone that improves four tenths you have worked a mir- like the hand of god has come down wow. and you have had a miracle yeah but what you're really most guys are going for a tenth of improvement to 
you know, let's say 0.15. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really if 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 an agent has us do work and we we do laser testing on them and they improve 0.15, they're happy. Okay. Um, but what we traditionally shoot for three tenths. That's our that's our goal with every every client in high school. It's really easy because mm-hmm. the kids don't even know how to line up. Right. Um, but going back to the science of getting faster, and you mentioned strength training, so let's start there. <clears throat> if an ath- and this is this is a this is a blanket statement because it's it can be found to be not true and it can be found to be true. But let's just say if you can bilateral press, not leg not leg press, mm-hmm. but deadlift or squat, assuming you have perfect technique, and let's not you know I don't want to get crucified by all these people. Like, well, you know. <laughs> right. so let's just make some assumptions here. One point seven times your body weight. Okay. There's a good chance that strength can no longer help you get faster. Okay. Now, let's go on the other side of that. If you can lift more than 2.5 times your body weight, mm-hmm. there's a good chance that your strength is now keeping you from getting faster. Mm. Okay. So think about it this way. Um, I don't know how much you know about horses, but plow horses don't race well and race horses don't plow well. Right. If you make a horse into a plow horse, you're not racing anymore. All right, All right. So when people do CrossFit for athletics, I'm like, okay, you are forever. I've had athletes that lose eligibility, go to CrossFit year, and they're like, I'm going to come back and train with you. They never, ever, ever get it back. Really? Why? Because you've taught the body to be a 70% machine. Mm. You, it, it could take years to build back the central nervous system components and ha- teach the body to get the adaptations back for speed. Because mm-hmm. speed adaptations are physiological. They're not just technical. Mm-hmm. You're not just going to be like, that's how I should move. I'm going to move this way. Right. Like it's not Terminator two or the matrix. Right. It's not how it works. So th- these things are exposures to movements. Mm-hmm. You have to move at a high velocity. Your body will adapt to high velocity, maximum speed movements from a physiological standpoint. And what I mean by that is your fascial systems, which is like a sheath that goes over our, your soft tissue. So if I were to cut you open, I wouldn't just see like bicep, tricep. It would right. look like a white sock and it would go, all the way around it could go from your your middle finger all the way around your shoulder all the way down to your opposite side ankle Mm -hmm. like that's a fascial line and people call them slings and they can do whatever they want but the reality is that's the thing you're rewiring when you go for speed okay you got to know your stuff you can't just guess if you're going to improve speed and when you have physiological adaptations for speed your tendons and ligaments change their density patterns and their elastic components Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can gain weight, but you don't look like you gain weight. Okay. And sometimes you're going to lose body fat because that's the adaptation the body needs to make, but you might not lose weight. And sometimes the body's going to reorganize, you know, timing systems, lever axes. There's, you know, the spinal engine. There's so many geeky things we could get into. Um, skill in dealing with gravity according to the, your particular body weight, like right at this moment. Mm-hmm. Um, synchronization of the arms and, and the legs as far as, the timing system, undulation and oscillation of the shoulder girdle mm-hmm, mm-hmm. versus the hip girdle. Um, what part of the foot you're landing on during strike phase, uh, toe off, what position you're in. It, 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 I mean, it literally is a complete science in itself. And so when we get a combine athlete, you, know, you start off with the big rocks. Like, what do they suck at? You know, For instance, if someone can't lift 1.7 times their body weight, we need to – concentrate a lot less on technique right now Mm -hmm. and get to that Mm -hmm. if someone is uber strong but can't jump they have a very serious problem with power production we should focus on power production and of course technique is something we should also consider Mm -hmm. so basically you look at what their deficits are when you attack their deficits whether it be power production that zero to 60 percent or zero to 30 percent if they can't move weight fast but they're strong work Mm -hmm. on that right if they're strong but they're not fast, work on power. Don't even let them do strength. Okay. You're going to get speed changes. Okay. Um, now, from a technical standpoint, there's acceleration technique, and then there is um, upright running technique. Those are two, two very different things. But if I've got someone for eight weeks to get ready for the NFL combine, I mean, <laughs> like if I came to you and I said, I don't know if you're a golfer, and I'm like, okay, I know you're going to the U.S. Open. So we're going to change your complete swing pattern. Yeah, that is not a good idea. Now, if I have a year to work with you, right? Let's do that. Yeah. yeah. If I've got eight weeks, we need to go. We need to go there with the devil we know. Okay. So sometimes when you have that short of a time, you can't reframe the wheel. So you've got to focus on what you can do. Gotcha. So when people see people at the common, like, I mean, the running technique isn't even good. Well, that could be a very conscious decision. Mm-hmm. 
United you know, athlete this year, and he, Gary wouldn't mind me talking about it. Gary Johnson ran the third fastest uh, time that a linebacker has ran in the history of the NFL combine. Yeah. Ran a four four two laser. Um, he had a slight, well, not a slight. He had a torn adductor that he tore the spring before he left Texas, and they they were um, their treatment strategy was very interesting, but it didn't it didn't um, it didn't heal. Well, we weren't going to do surgery, and he's a non-draft, non-draft grade because of his size and his background and stuff. Mm-hmm. So we thought we just got to show up and run. Well, he had a little hitch in his giddy up, uh-huh. and people would be like, "You need to fix it." I'm like, "If I fix that, he will literally tear his adductor off the bone because that hitch is what's keeping him balanced from his, the asymmetry that he has." Wow. So a lot of times when people watch things, they make judgments like, "Oh, if he just fix his arms, or if he do this," but maybe yeah. they're not seeing the big picture of yeah. how is this. How, how is this working in the chain reaction biomechanics sequence uh-huh, here? Uh-huh. You know, how, how is this working? Like, is, it's funny to me when these, <laughs> these performance coaches mm-hmm. uh, that, are, that are touring in our profession because they did something else and right. didn't work out. Right. I'm not going to mention any names. There's a couple here. But um, when they're doing that, and then they're like critiquing Olympic athletes and how their technique is. I'm just like, guys, man, you just don't. You have no idea the considerations that have taken place. Yeah. You know, and if someone has a an ankle on one side that has a serious biomechanical block that you might not fix, like it's a it's a structure. Right. You know, it's like you don't drive through a lighthouse in the ocean. You go around it. Right. You don't know why their technique could be altered. Yeah. And so I just think the respect inside when you when you get to when you're in the level of coaching speed on that level, the amount of respect that coaches have for each other, I think it's, it's different and that you're, you're a lot less to have snap judgments on people's technique. Once yeah. you realize the, the true, um, chain reaction biomechanics and all the components of sprinting. Well, you know, and think about it. If, if it were just as simple as, okay, there is a formulaic way to swing a baseball bat. Right. If, you, if you don't do that, then you'll never, well then, Let's look at all the different swings to the years. Let's look at Wade Boggs to Julio Franco to, you know, you name it, yeah. Big Poppy. They're, they're all over the place. Yeah. Uh, same thing with, you know, pitchers, you know. I mean, if, quarterbacks. Uh, quarterbacks, yeah. exactly. Great example. I mean, if, they, if there were just one formulaic way to do it, then they would all look exactly the same. But, and I think that that translates over into this. One of the things that, you know, Josh, again, to bring him up, talked about was whenever he became a pitcher is like he's like, there were a few things I could do well enough to get played to play this game at. And yes. most of the other stuff I was just good at, but not good enough to get paid. And when I figured out what those things were that I was good enough to get paid, that's what I focused on. And it's one of the things that I try to tell people that I've had to learn is like, you know, don't attack your weaknesses constantly. If it's your strength and it looks funny, but it's your strength, hone it. Play and to the, it. Like, yep. like what Ryan Holiday in his book, The, the Obstacle is the Way. Okay, so you've got a hitch, but you're about to run uh, a four four two in the yeah. combine. Keep the hitch. Yeah, that that what, what would normally be an obstacle, <laughs> let it be the way. That's how I run, you know? Right. And so I think that's there's a lot of wisdom in that that goes beyond just athletics, right? Is it, not everything has to look the same. If it works, it works. You work with what you got. That's right. There is no there is no technique. Um, the technique is is driven by what you're working with. Yeah. And, and yes, we do have a framework and we do have a bandwidth and, and it's optimal, yeah. right? And we do have a system that our coaches go through to learn. But the more I do this and the more we do this, we've seen record-breaking performances that we've been a part of in jumps and lifts and sprints and on the field and it's just done the way that it wasn't supposed to be done. Right. So you have to come to the conclusion that there's a lot of ways to to perform at a high level. Yeah. You know, and you, and you but you have to find ways. It's like with Patrick, you look at his game, you have to train him in the way that his athletic attributes are advantageous for him because mm-hmm. quarterback is one of those positions where you can dictate how you use your athleticism to play the position. Right. That's not always the case. Right. But in that particular position, mm-hmm. you can decide how you solve those problems. Yeah. And that is his strength. He's a problem solver and he is very unorthodox. And so it's hard for, he's hard to defend. Right. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of people in, that we've worked with in baseball, you know, look, a wind up, a wind up is just a, a, a human body trying to find the right position to get in to move through transformational zones yeah. so everybody's transformational zones are different because their humor link uh, humorous length is different than yours and their their length of their femur is different 
and the size of their foot is different. There's so many factors to tell someone like this is how you do a uh, a wind up when they're you know when somebody's on second and this right. is how you do like out of the stretch this uh, it drives me nuts. Yeah, you know it's like look, can you just stop doing that and tell the kids the result you want? Right, and then there's still plenty of coaching left. Trust mm-hmm. me, <laughs> but you know this you know control freak skill coaching style. Um, a good example is when Peyton Manning was, you know, everything. Yeah. Every kid just stood up on their tippy toes and tried to throw the ball down, and they all looked ridiculous <laughs> except for Peyton Manning. Right. Even his brother looks ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, don't get me on that. But anyway, um, it's just, a, you know, sport is an expression of movement, and it's personal. Yeah. yeah. Now, tell me this, because it's, uh, somebody who has capitalized on not only um, – his Super Bowl wins and just who he is, Tom Brady. Yeah. Now the whole TB13 with his his whole deal is pliability. Oh, and yeah. Some of what you're talking about, you know, looking at those small little the tendons where the tendon meets the muscle and making sure that that stays is is soft. You know, he'll he'll show you. So is he doing the right things? I mean, in, in, beyond the fact that he's still out there at you know almost my age, um, tell me about what you think about his program and what he's doing. So Tom is Tom's incredible, and I. I know him through some people, and um, what you hear is is pretty much true. I mean, this guy is so dedicated and relentless, and I mean, he's perfect rep, Tom. Mm -hmm. This is who he is, even now. But this guy's walking the walk from a nutrition standpoint. He didn't like how his body was regressing, and he's reversed it, and he's just gotten a little better every year at, at attacking different parts of his lifestyle to keep him from aging himself out of a performance that he's holding himself a standard to. Um, You know, Alex uh, gets a lot of credit, but I think that's mainly because they're business partners. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that Tom House um, is truly his mentor behind all these things. Okay. So, and Alex has learned a lot from Tom Brady Mm -hmm. that Tom House taught Tom Brady and they've kind of made a business out of it. Okay. So, Tom House was Nolan Ryan's pitching coach. He's got a PhD in nutrition. He's worked with hundreds of major league baseball pitchers and also um most of the great quarterbacks in the last 15 years have been personal clients of tom's okay so um the pliability concept was kind of just a coin term i'm not gonna be harsh like some of these people would they made it up and it doesn't make sense there's a lot of it that does make sense um do i think that pliability is a word i don't don't know i don't care but Mm -hmm. here's the thing a lot of the stuff brady's talking about from a broad scope the reality is it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Is he a little fanatical about it? <laughs> is it a little bit strange, you know, hitting him with boxing gloves when he's doing rollouts? Yeah, I think that's unnecessary. Right. But I do think that that he is at least on to some things that movement is probably more important than some of the traditional strength conditioning approaches. Yeah. Especially at his stage in the game. Right. So I think there's a lot to be learned there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've learned a lot, Bobby. Man, that hour flew by. Man, <laughs> Sorry, man. I it. just that's awesome. No, I, this this went exactly the way I wanted it. But one of the things before I let you go, because yeah. I ask every guest the same question in uh, Stephen Covey's book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. There's a chapter in which he has an exercise. It's one of those put the book down and do this exercises and. He describes how, let's say, you're walking down the street and you hear music coming from a building. The building's a church. You walk up and you walk in, and it's a funeral. You walk to the casket and you realize you're at your funeral. And this is where Covey says, all right, close the book and write down what do you want said about you when this is all said and done. So, Bobby, athlete, entrepreneur, uh, coaching at the highest level, what do you want said about you when this is all said and done, man? Wow, man. Holy goodness. Yeah, we're getting deep. Um, I, you know, I really, you know, aside from very personal things, you know, I really, I really want to create a legacy that, that people know that I've got something that's going to live on beyond, you know, after me that protects futures and improves lives to the field of human performance. And that the bottom line is that, I really do care about these things and I care about the development of young people. I'm a product of, I'm a product of people caring about my development. Mm -hmm. I could have gone a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and I had good parents and I had a lot of good coaches that invested in me. And if they wouldn't, if they wouldn't instilled some habits and thought processes in me that some, 
that, that helped me see myself improving at a rate, then I wouldn't be affecting lives, assuming that I am, I wouldn't be affecting lives the way that I am now and the way that all my employees are. So I just, I want that legacy. I, selfishly, I want the legacy of people saying, man, that guy really was a, took a beating for the initiatives that he believed in because he wanted to protect futures and improve lives for the field of human performance. Yeah. And it hadn't been easy to stand against CrossFit. Yeah. And it hadn't been easy to run a business. But I felt like a lot of these things were necessary to accomplish, you know, those two things. Yeah. Well, I tell you, one of my favorite takeaways from this whole interview is that you said, you know, I've got a resume now, so I don't care. And I think that more people need to understand that, <laughs> that you know what, you know, <laughs> listen, I'm reading a book right now uh, by Ryan Holiday. And it talks about exactly what you're saying. It's called... Uh, perennial and it's about you know making things that are that last you know writing a bestseller writing doing something that what you just said that lives on beyond you and one of the things that he he talks about is do the work and care so much about doing the work right that it does live on beyond you and that's what that is you know is because once you've done it and and he says a lot of people ideas don't don't matter ideas don't it's it's what have you executed what can you point to and go well you know you can question me but look at that look at yeah. look at philip umber look at travis chick look at patrick mahomes you, go and then come back and talk to me because there's my resume you yeah. know and so i think that that's a great message for anyone out there you may have big ideas you may think you've got it but until you've got the proven uh execution hey it's a, it's all just air right yeah, but, I mean, we're all still chasing. Nobody's satisfied over here, that's for sure. We've got a long way to go. <laughs> all right. Well, brother, thank you so much for this time. It's been great. Oh, before we go, let's say I'm an athlete. Yeah. Uh, how early can I start with APEC? How do we find you? Yeah. I don't care. And, because I know there's you, you work with athletes all over, so right. talk, uh, let's talk a little bit about the business. Just I want to give you a plug here for taking this time for me. I appreciate it. So we have a program called Long-Term Athletic Development that's three levels. The first level is kindergarten through second grade. Next level is third through fifth grade. And then the uh, third and fourth levels are middle school. And no, we are not timing them and separating them out. It's what's appropriate for their tissues, their brain development, their long-term development, and most notably spinal development. Um, So it's going to be very curriculum specific. And they're going to just think they're having fun. But there's a purpose. And in high school, it gets sports specific, of course. Um, Then of collegiate and pro we have a lot of options there we have remote training now where we can do worldwide training for people on a remote app platform Um, and then we do consulting for teams we do technology support for teams Um, and we're easy to find it's at team apec on social media for uh, east texas and corporate and then at apec 817 the numbers uh, on social media for anybody in the dfw area perfect all right my brother Bobby, thank you, man. Thank you for your time. Hey, folks, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Texas Titans podcast. Before you go, I wanted to let you know where you can find us out there on the interwebs. You can go to show notes as well as listen to all the past episodes and look for upcoming uh, shows at texttitans.blog. Also, that has all the different formats that you can listen to the show on if you go there. So, texttitans.blog. You can also go to jasonrightnow.com. That has not only a link to the podcast, but it also has a link to my Make Your Own Rules blog that I think you'll enjoy, so please check that out. Also, it has information about my executive coaching business, speaking, and anything else like that. So jasonrightnow.com. That's literally just my name, jasonrightnow.com. On Twitter, I'm at jasonrighttx. I would really appreciate a follow. I have not been a big Twitter user, so I need you guys to help me with that. So please uh, take the time to go out to Jason Wright TX, find me and follow me. I'm trying to get more active with it. And so if you'll engage with me, I'll try to do a better job of engaging with you. So I would appreciate that. And then on Instagram, I'd really appreciate a follow there. I'm at Jason Wright now. Again, my name now. So please follow me on Instagram. And then on Facebook, I'm also at Jason Wright TX. So check us out there. I'm, and I'm also on LinkedIn. So look for me there. I try to use as many platforms as possible to let you know about upcoming shows, past shows, and then also just anything that I find interesting. I'm trying to push it out and get better with the social media. So please check us out out there and follow us. I would be most grateful. And also please do not forget 
it means the world to me for you to go to iTunes, give us a rating right now. We've got that five-star rating. I'm hoping to hold that. Please, please, please. The comments that people are writing are so very kind. Thank you so much. It means the world to me. And that's how we keep moving up in the ranks. And right now, we're crushing it with downloads. The show has really had incredible feedback thanks to you guys. So I'm grateful. Please keep that momentum going by giving us a, uh, a review on iTunes. Thanks so much. And have a great day. And as always, I could not be more grateful for you listening. Thanks.